Thanks. Um, so thanks, Henry. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I was here about uh, 10 years ago uh, giving a talk on rather technical aspects of some of these, so I, I won't go into the details of that, but I always use my background in scientific computing and particularly in Einstein's equations as a, as a natural uh, illustrator of trends that we see in science. And I think since I've come at NSF, I've learned an incredible amount about the need for groups to work together across disciplinary boundaries and, uh, and the struggles of doing that, either from the academic perspective or from the funding agency perspective, uh, how you actually enable that, or also from just um, social perspective, how you uh, have different groups with very different cultures, perhaps uh, geophysically located uh, across the world, how they might really work together. So I will, I'll start off by illustrating a little bit about one, one slide of a history lesson here uh, about the history of science, particularly around general relativity and gravitation. And I, I began thinking about this when I was preparing talks like this a few years ago about the fact that the area of general relativity is one that's been dominated by single towering figures working in very mathematical, of course, uh, and it has not been very conducive to uh, team research, let's say, until the last couple of decades, and, and, and over that time it has really exploded as a large collaborative endeavor. And you see this in many areas of science and engineering. So I'll just start off by pointing out about, oh, 300 years ago, 400 years ago now, people like Galileo and Newton, of course, ushered in what we would think of as really the modern era of, of uh, science, particularly uh, Galileo as maybe an early data-driven scientist, although that we're, we weren't using that language at that time. But the first, one of the early people to really think about data uh, and the reproducibility of science through experiments and recording things very carefully and so on. And of course, many of the, uh, the revolutions that Galileo and Newton brought in were based on very careful observations, of course, of the solar system leading to theory, the theory of gravity. But if you were to sort of quantify the amount of data that they generated, it would be at the level of what you could write in a notebook. So di digitize that and it's of order kilobytes of data. So not a lot. Uh, but uh, it was enough in order to really completely change our view of, of, the, uh, of the universe. And so theory was then driven by data. Of course, computation, uh, there weren't any computers, but perhaps there were adding devices, abacuses, and so on, or just smart people. If you think about how much computation a person can do, even if they're a very smart uh, calculator, maybe it's a floating point operation per second. You can't sustain that for very long, if you're a, even if you're very smart. But that's at the level of the kind of data and science and, and uh, um, quantitatively put in, in modern uh, language that people were doing back then. Uh, one of the most important aspects of this is collaboration. So you're talking about typically one person working uh, in isolation, perhaps communicating by letters or at, at meetings, but it's very laborious in order for people to get together, perhaps one or two students. So this is the culture of science. And in fact, it wasn't just the culture of science back three or 400 years ago. It was the culture of science. It remains the culture of science today to some degree, but it's changing so rapidly. So the next person I wanted to highlight here is Bob Dylan, who um, taught me a lot uh, over, over the years. And in particular, the times are really changing. And I want to illustrate how that culture of science has changed so dramatically. So let's just fast forward now to the um, late 70s, uh, early, early to late 70s, the last part of, or late part of the last century. And you still have this kind of scientific work that's in that style, which is, uh, of course, it's still going on today, and it, and it will continue, but now in a new context. So this work of Hawking, which is of the early uh, version of visualization, let's say, of two black holes colliding, worked out completely from theoretical ideas. Um, Think about the culture and the computations and so on that were done for this. It's more or less the same as Newton and Galileo, but hundreds of years later. It's a single person. There's no uh, large computer. If you were to digitize this and think of it as a scientific visualization, it's perhaps 50 kilobytes of data. So in terms of modern language, it's something like that. But the point is that the, the uh, culture of doing science is very much the same as it was hundreds of years ago. So about 20 years later, um, first pioneered by people like Larry Smarr, the same problem of two black holes colliding was now able to be simulated. So this is a calculation that um, I and a group of people led by, uh, also by Wai Mosuin at uh, Washington University uh, developed. This is when I was at the University of Illinois, and that's the computer we used at the time. This is a Cray YMP. Um, there were about um, 10 people in this collaboration now, because in order to do this calculation, we needed to have people who were experts in general relativity, computational mathematics, 
parallel computing, scientific visualization, and so on. So we're beginning to get to the point where a single individual is rarely able to carry out all of the, the has the kind of expertise and is able to integrate it to carry out computations like this. If you look at the amount of data we generated in order to do this calculation, but sort of, I would say, you know, honestly on a supercomputer, so it's, we have control of numerical errors. We could arbitrarily accurately compute that solution, and we could specify the error bars based on our a, a mathematical analysis of the, the finite difference techniques we used. We generated in that calculation about 50 megabytes of data. So the thing I'm trying to point out here is over 20 years, after about three or 400 years of a culture that was more or less static, um, we have now a group that's a, an order of magnitude larger, and we've generated a thousand times as much data over a period of, a, of about 20 years. And so, so that was um, a sort of a big uh, change in the culture of science. Now, a few years later, this is an axisymmetric calculation, by the way, the full three-dimensional calculation, which is visualized here uh, with two black holes colliding, and this is now carried out with a larger team uh, led uh, at, at the Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam, where I was at the time with an international collaboration. In fact, Karsten is around here somewhere. Karsten was a, a member of, of this collaboration. So now, just a few years later, this is much harder. In fact, it's a thousand times more data coming out because it's a full three-dimensional calculation, many more variables, and of course, it goes up dramatically. But you can see over very short periods of time, the culture and also the amount of data in particular is changing at levels of orders of magnitude. So this particular collaboration and then others that have grown out of it have now led to uh, entire community toolkits where people are working together across many disciplines. And there's a, a project now called the Einstein Toolkit that is funded by groups from the NSF, from Max Planck, and from others around the world where they're sharing software environments. And in fact, Luciano Rozzola, who's now at the AEI in Potsdam, and a, a large group have done this calculation of two neutron stars colliding where they've been able to add in magnetic fields. And for the first time, they see very naturally um, jets developing through the, the twisting of magnetic fields and so on during the, the in spiral of two black holes or two neutron stars. And so the point is that a, a larger and larger community are being enabled by sharing tools and software environments. And in fact, in this case, you don't actually have 67 members working on this one thing, but people develop individual modules and, and tools, and they sort of they vet them with each other and so on, and they begin to work together more loosely as a community, not as one large team. And that's one of the, the key points, of course, uh, that, that science is moving in a direction where not only large teams, but levels, all levels of the hierarchy, from individuals to graduate student groups to, to communities where the people don't actually necessarily work together or even know each other are beginning to work together. So to me, this is a, a major triumph of computational science. So I know a lot of you in this room are, are experts in relativity, and you'll know that basically for 100 years, we haven't been able to solve Einstein's equations in any, uh, under any circumstances analytically, but now numerically, with a 3 plus 1 sort of formalism, it is possible to solve, uh, in very general circumstances, the full three-dimensional Einstein's equations applied to things like black holes and neutron stars and, and astrophysical phenomena. This wasn't possible without many advances in computational science and the ability for uh, people to work together collaboratively. So. That's just the kind of the warm up. So now that you've kind of conquered Einstein's equations and you can begin to add in hydrodynamics and magnetic fields and so on, you can begin to apply them to very complex phenomena in the universe. It's just one ingredient in, among many that you need in order to study uh, complex phenomena. So for example, in this problem of gamma ray bursts, you need to incorporate relativity, hydrodynamics, nuclear physics, radiation transport, neutrinos, and, and so on, if you really want to put in all that's needed. If you were to look at the computational problem, and there are some articles that have been written that specifically look at the computational components and the sort of the, the scale of the problem, you can convince yourself that you could would saturate any large-scale computer uh, that could be built right now for days or so in order to just do this kind of a calculation at a minimal level, and, and then to put in all, all the data to be able to analyze the data that you'd want, you'd want to be able to put out petabytes. And so we're talking about factors of thousands to millions above what we uh, were just talking about just a, a few years before. So the data, again, are going up by factors of 10, 100,000 over very short periods of time. So I would say that it, this is the sort of the first lesson I want to draw is that computational science has completely transformed the way on the theoretical side that general relativity is being done. And of course, on the experimental side, some of you are probably uh, here engaged in 
uh, the LIGO scientific collaboration where you now have, uh, well now, the last I looked it was about 900 members of the LIGO scientific collaboration that are agreeing to share data from gravitational wave uh, observing uh, uh, observatories like LIGO, Virgo, and so on. LIGO is currently down right now, but I'm sure most of you are familiar roughly with LIGO as we prepare for an advanced version of this. So we have theory and experiment for the first time really connecting deeply in general relativity. And on both sides, it's been transformed from individual experimenters and theoreticians, mathematicians, working now to uh, much larger teams and also the ability of, of people to work across uh, many uh, uh, hierarchies of collaboration from individuals to large teams. So to me, this is an example of a, a new style of science that's emerging in the 21st century. Okay, so I still talk mostly about what's going on right now. So let's now extrapolate a few years into the future. And so from the vantage point of, of the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate, I, I spend a lot of time now looking at telescopes and, uh, and experiments and so on. And actually, if you were an observer or a theoretician in, in the next decade and a gamma ray burst goes off and they'll be going off all the time, they are going off all the time, you might actually be able to observe them in all of these channels of, of science. So in fact, all, fun, all four fundamental forces, you'd be able to see them. So for example, electromagnetics, uh, you have uh, new radio telescopes going online. This is uh, the ALMA array, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in, in Chile in the Atacama Desert. Uh, it's just gone into operation with a small subset of the number of antennas. Right now, 16 antennas are working together. Within a few years, uh, there'll be 64, but it's already the world's most advanced uh, 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 radio telescope uh, environment. And then the uh, extended very large array in New Mexico uh, has also just gone online. Um, there is an experiment, some of you may be engaged in it, at the South Pole called Ice Cube, where a cubic kilometer of uh, ice has been instrumented so that neutrinos can be observed coming from cosmic sources. Uh, and so uh, when if something like a gamma ray burst goes off, of course, you may see them in the South Pole. You may see them in South America. You may see the, the events in different channels. So here you have uh, elect not electromagnetic, but cosmic rays. So you are probing strong and weak force interactions there. And then you have, of course, very large optical telescopes being proposed in South America. And of course, uh, many of you know that the, the Santa Barbara here is engaged in the development of a project called the 30 meter telescope. So these are highly digital instruments that will be producing large amounts of data. Of course, we have LIGO with two detectors being built in the US, the, the advanced versions of the detectors. And there is a possibility that one of these detectors may uh, actually, well, we have three. That's a, a complicated story. Two detectors are being installed in Hanford, Washington. But one of them could potentially move to India. And because of the, the properties of being able to triangulate the, um, the signals, you'd be able to, to actually have gravitational wave events being not only detected, but, uh, but uh, their direction would be known. So you could correlate those with electromagnetic neutrinos you know, uh, observations as well. So the point is that with all of these things going on, when, when a gamma ray bursts or a supernova or some other event goes off, you may see signals in all of these and you want to find a way to correlate these events. And right now, the amounts of data that are being generated are just too much for us to be able to handle, to be able to correlate. And in fact, also, the intellectual property arrangements around these uh, uh, projects is rather tricky. So those, these data are not necessarily all open for everyone to analyze, And so, but it, it would be in the interest of science if at some level we could share that data. So there's policy and cyber infrastructure development that have to um, occur to do that. So the last one I want to point out here is um, the, uh, a project called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. This is a project that's under development. Uh, it's a potential project for um, a start of funding by, for construction by the National Science Foundation. So we're currently evaluating this right now. So if this were to be built, it would be taking data in a very new way uh, for astronomy. So basically, well, it's been prototyped and developed by others. For example, the um, um, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey of the last decade. So it's a similar version, but this would be much more comprehensive. So every, uh, every 16 seconds, it will take an image uh, on the sky, and then it will move a little bit, and then a little bit later, a little bit later. And over three nights successively, it covers the entire sky that's available to it, and then it starts over again. And so over a period of a decade, it will generate an entire movie of the southern um, uh, sky that's available from the southern hemisphere. So every single night, this telescope will generate as much data as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey did in a decade. 
So this is every night, and it's going to be taken from a mountaintop in Chile. So, and no one is going to go to that observatory and sort of peer through the, the viewfinder. What they're going to do is get access to the data. So it completely changes the observing modality. So people will be sharing the data in order to see what's going on in that. And of course, there will be more data with potentially hundreds of thousands to a million transient events every single night that this thing will be able to capture than we have astronomers who can possibly troll through that data and so on to look at it. So we'll drive the development of new computer science algorithms, new statistical analysis, analysis methods, new cyber infrastructure, because this data will have to be served to a global collaboration around the world. Okay, so, so this is all now coming potentially from one single event, that is the, from, a, from a gamma ray burst. But I'm not finished, because I'd like to talk about, um, well, th there's another event, I forgot, there's one more uh, big telescope on the, uh, on the horizon that's being uh, uh, planned by astronomers called the Square Kilometer Array, or the SKA. So this would be 3,000 radio antennas. Uh, that will have a square kilometer of collecting area for radio astronomy. And it will be collecting data at the level of exabytes of data. So these are just words, but we're getting up into you know, millions to trillions of times as much data as people are used to now. So the technology will be able to generate that. But this is now coming back, we'll just keep repeating, to, this event, uh, to visualizing or um, observing the same event. And so in order to really understand this, you want to really be able to correlate all of this with observations and simulations. And so I show here a, a visualization of a, currently of a, a supernova. This is carried out by Christian Ott, um, now at Caltech, uh, and a collaboration. Uh, and there's a large supercomputer being placed at the University of Illinois next year called Blue Waters that will be a, a, a petascale machine of order 10 to uh, or more petaflops. And so the point is that you want to be able to correlate the, the theory, the observations, uh, and in all these different channels together. So how are we going to create the kind of policy environments and the cyber infrastructure and also the social motivations, in effect, for people to be able to share all of this data so we can really get at the scientific problem? So in order to do this, we, we will need end-to-end -end integration of the cyber infrastructure. So people work at their desktops or in conferences and they're distributed around the world, so we have to have that. And we have to think about ways and incentives for communities to be able to share data, the software environments to be able to analyze all of this, to carry out these simulations. This is something I'm, I'm very concerned about because the software environments are increasingly complex, involving large teams, Somebody's making mistakes somewhere, somebody's changing a code, and these elements all have to work together. So we have to really think very deeply about software engineering, uh, not only for correctness of science, but for reproducibility of science. And you could imagine now a publication should, in principle, carry along not just the steps of your proof of a theorem, but uh, the things that you use in order to derive results, whether it's driven by simulation or data analysis, including potentially the, the data itself. All right, so I've talked mostly about the very big things, kind of driven, first of all, by relativity and astronomy. Uh, but I, I want to point out that there's a completely other, completely different way of doing science that I think is actually dominant over the others, the so-called long tail of science. So what I've talked about is sort of the, the 1 to 10 percent of scientists that are very highly organized around specific instruments. But uh, the larger parts of the communities tend to be much more disorganized. They have a lot of data, uh, potentially biologists, chemists, material scientists, and so on. And they're, it's much harder to organize that. But on the other hand, we want very much to be able to make the data from those experiments and small scale simulations and so on available so that people can work together in a collaborative way. And so you imagine um, thousands of biologists that are each uh, having DNA sequencers on their campuses. It turns out that even with today's technology, DNA sequencers can generate uh, data at the rate of a terabyte per minute. And we're talking, if you integrate that, that's like a large hadron collider in, in somebody's laboratory here on this campus. And it's not just like the, you know, the large hadron collider is the only thing that generates that amount of data. Everybody is getting data sources like this. So how do we handle that? Uh, there is a, a project that now that's developing that um, 
uh, inspired in part by a group at MIT with what they call the materials genome, kind of building on the, the, the nomenclature from the biology commu communities, where they want to make databases of materials properties available for people to share. And, but at the moment, we have no, no way of, no national data infrastructure or set of services to, to support uh, the distribution of materials properties. And so there is a, the beginnings of a program at NSF in collaboration, particularly with the DOE, called um, a DMREF for Designing and Manufacturing uh, Materials uh, Involving Engineering, Computer Science, and, and particularly the, the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate. So that's another example. Another one is um, in the social sciences. So I, uh, there's a nice movie, but I, I couldn't get a copy of it without a, a YouTube uh, to play it. But um, there's a beautiful example of social scientists now analyzing uh, tweets from uh, people across the country to analyze whether they're happy or sad or what their mood is. And by certain sort of text analysis uh, from computer science, they can then sort of tell, is a state that to aggregate all the tweets, you know, is a state happy or sad at the moment? And they've made a movie of this. And it turns out, I, I live in Louisiana now, actually, in Washington, but I'm sort of, I'm a professor still at, at LSU. Louisiana was the only state in this movie of a 24-hour period that never went happy. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I don't know, but, but and it's a pretty happy state, it seemed to me, but not according to their tweets. Um, all right. So how do we deal with this, the, the sort of heterogeneous, even hand-generated data that's not curated, reused, or served? And I think this is a national issue. That we, It's international, in fact. We had a, a wonderful conference with the European Commission back in, uh, in January where we specifically were looking at how we could coordinate actions from U, the EU and the NSF to help begin to provide some some way of uh, harnessing the power of the uh, small, the long tail of science. So how do we do this? So I just I have one more example um, that I particularly learned a lot from because of living in Louisiana. This is Hurricane Katrina, and these black dots are the actual observed locations, and these uh, sort of spaghetti lines coming out or different supercomputer simulations of where it would go according to different models. And this is about three days out. So within three days, we knew that all the models were converging and it was likely to actually hit the coast of uh, Louisiana around the New Orleans area. But the, the, this is a really interesting problem from many points of view. So first of all, just modeling the hurricane tracks themselves require very sophisticated fluid dynamics of the atmosphere that re depend on information that are injected into the initial, initial conditions uh, that tell you about the, uh, the wave heights and the wind velocities and the currents and so on. You have to take also information from the temperature and the currents within the, the water and that feeds into the, um, the atmospheric models. You have satellite observations that feed into this as well and then you get all of these uh, different uh, models. Now, that's just for the winds. The thing that people are worried about the most on the coastline here is the storm surge and that's not captured at all in these models. So they have have completely different communities that develop storm surge models, and it turns out they're very, very particularly specialized to the local um, conditions. And so there's a separate storm surge model for the Texas coast that there is from the uh, Louisiana coast to the Florida panhandle and so on, because the conditions are different. And depending on the depths of the water, you may have shallow water equations or you need full three-dimensional uh, uh, treatments and whether it's marshy or sandy and so on. So for every one of these models, in principle, you need to couple it to a different storm surge model depending on where the thing is going. So you've got a, almost a combinatoric problem here of possibility for how, what's the storm surge going to be like. And then there are, of course, the issues of what happens to the levees. And so in, in New Orleans, in fact, that was the Achilles heel of the whole thing. No matter what these models said and no matter what the storm surge models said, there wasn't an understanding of the integrity of the levees. And that's finally what gave way and led to thousands of people dying and, and millions of dollars in damage. And in fact, a complete culture change of the city of Louisiana because people left and have never come back. And so the city has changed dramatically because of this. So what we would like to be able to do is to couple together all of these different kinds of things from satellites to sensors to atmospheric models to storm surge models to civil engineering to social and behavioral models. In fact, one of the, another problem around this, this particular event was people had assumed that people would get away by simply driving. But of course, in Louisiana, it's a very poor state. A lot of people don't even have cars. And so there was no way for people to get out. There was no public transportation system. And so there were just many issues there that, that really combine uh, social, behavioral, economic sciences all the way through fluid dynamics and, uh, and sensor networks and so on, and supercomputing in order to look at this problem. So to me, 
This illustrates the issue of what, what we're calling Grand Challenge Communities. So um, some of you will remember the old Grand Challenge programs from the NSF. I, I kind of grew up in that. It changed my career a lot. But they're still there. There was the idea that there was a team, and we would go solve the black hole problem or the, you know, the, the problem of cosmology or something like that. Now we're talking about the real world where we have much more complex things, and we need to find ways to enable larger communities to work together. And, and that's what we're struggling with a lot at NSF, about the culture of supporting that. So, so coming to this idea of grand challenge communities for complex problems, they clearly require many disciplines and they require all scales of collaboration. So I've talked a lot about teams, but of course in this model, it's not like everyone works in a big team. The individual efforts are still critical to this, but you need to embed that in a, in a sort of a more collaborative, uh, more transparent model. So you have these multi-scale collaborations that develop between individuals, between different teams, between different communities, and they're dynamic. So depending on what happens, people will aggregate and move according to new uh, d discoveries or new problems. Uh, and so on. So, so I just want to focus on this part of it. So this is a fundamental observation then of, of the last uh, uh, year, as I, I would say, is that people collaborate and they work together by sharing data. Ultimately, that's what it is. So every time you have an interaction with someone, you, uh, if it's an email even, you're exchanging data. A cell phone conversation, you're actually exchanging data. Someone once called this biologically enabled wireless communication. This is talking. <laughs> this, is, this is sharing data. Okay, so there are ways that it's all about sharing data, actually. And if you sort of take that basic uh, uh, principle and you sort of scale it out, how can we enable the sharing of data to allow this kind of interaction to occur on a much more uh, individual basis so groups can reassemble as they need to. A lot of it is about that. And of course, I think it, it speaks a lot to uh, everything from the, the technologies to the culture of how people work together, what university structures are there, to what reward systems are there for people to be able to work together. Um, I had a, uh, this uh, interdisciplinary center that Henry mentioned at the university, at Louisiana State University, and we had joint appointments with different uh, departments. And so uh, we had one of our criteria for success was how many multi-author papers do you have? And uh, so it turns out we were hiring assistant professors, and they were being told by their home department, your main criterion for success is how many single-author papers do you have? And so <laughs> we're immediately getting into culture clashes that, that put people in sort of jeopardy because the incentive and reward structures aren't really there for this new way of doing science. And I would say also publications are changing dramatically. So what a publication is, a lot of you who work in general relativity and astrophysics will say, well, I just put stuff on GRQC or AstroPH. Um, uh, and so it's an electronic version. Does anybody ever print it off? Well, occasionally, but it's mostly electronic. It's not paper very much anymore. But associated with that, you could imagine data sets uh, and, and software environments and so on. And then you could imagine also if the, all of the publications were actually available without subscription firewalls to, to the science community, you'd be able to find out what's available from one community into another much more rapidly. So, so I, I published a paper once in Physical Review Letters that I was very proud of. And uh, it, it turned out, I realized when talking to some people from fluid dynamics communities, that was actually a fairly trivial idea uh, in that community. I had a different variant on it, but you know, it basically, it wasn't nearly as deep as I thought it was. And if only I had been able to sort of have a search engine that could help me discover some finite difference algorithms. Um, in my case, I wanted to respect the causal structure of space-time, but in this case, it was just upwind differencing from another point of view, basically. And so um, I would have learned that in a much more natural way if I'd been able to search all the literature. And I think we're, we have technologies that are sophisticated enough to just about do that these days. But we're prevented from doing that by firewalls around publications. OK, well, let me just point out that people are using social networking technologies to collaborate now. So these are tweets that come from a simulation code. Uh, or a, a simulation code framework, uh, but the Cactus framework. In fact, this is work done by Eric Schneider, who's now at uh, the Perimeter Institute, uh, formerly at LSU. So this code is, is happily telling its collaborators what's happening by sending out tweets. You know, I've, I've evolved to time step something, the black holes have just collided or whatever. And you can also send uh, scientific visualizations uh, directly from the, the simulation code onto Twitter, I mean uh, Flickr, where people are actually storing pictures of their kids or of their favorite uh, simulations, perhaps. 
And so it's a way of using social networking technologies to allow people to collaborate sort of asynchronously, which is, is the, kind of the goal here. So, so one point about all of this is that this new way of doing science, I think, is going to require research into how people collaborate fundamentally. And so social, behavioral, and economic sciences are going to be critical to understanding this new um, uh, style of collaboration across much larger scales. So this is just to point out that there are lots of examples like this in all areas. So I, I barely mentioned the Large Hadron Collider, but that's sort of the earliest version of large-scale collaboration, very highly organized. Uh, they're very expert, by the way, in, in figuring out how to distribute data to their collaborators, but they're not very open at all to sharing their data, say, between Atlas and CMS. And so that, that doesn't happen right now, right? So there's a lot of... Yes. <laughs> right. So what are we going to do about that? And so some of you will know I, I deal a lot with the National Science Board uh, that, that approves or disapproves large projects. And every single project that comes to them now, their most big concern is uh, after the science and the management and so on is about are the data being able to be served up to a larger group of scientists than just the, the sort of the owners of the experiment and so on. And so that's going to be an issue over time that, that will have to change. So this just illustrates that there are many examples, including the, the Twitter. This is uh, the tweets I was talking about. See if you can see here, Louisiana is, not, uh, is, is red. And, uh, and Cinegrid, this is where uh, the arts community is really getting engaged in these sort of data-intensive um, activities. So you can take a look for some of those if you want to look them up. So I'll just um, I'll stop uh, the first part of my talk here just by concluding that uh, modern science is very different from the way it was even just a couple of decades ago after centuries of more or less being uh, the same, I would say. If you look at just the last four decades, I looked at sort of ex growth of data and computing capacity and so on. It's 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 12th uh, factors of growth in those areas after not much change. So this, if you look at it over the fullness of time, it's like a step function, basically hundreds of years and suddenly we're up by 12 orders of magnitude in the data and the computing capacity that's needed to do science science these days, so it's really extraordinary. So I, I think you, you, you can't quite, you can't overestimate the impact of that. So I just wanted to point out then that many people are aware of this data deluge being a, a key problem that we're facing. There are just all of these articles and you can, you can search them out. Um, I'll just point out that the most colorful of them, the very month that I came to the National Science Foundation, Wired Magazine proclaimed that science is over. <laughs> said, the end of science. And basically they were saying that the methodologies we've been using for science are going to change so dramatically that science as we know it um, won't, won't ever be the same. And I think that's, that's probably true. Uh, there's a book here called the, the Fourth Paradigm, which sort of a, maybe a more polite way of saying that, that there's a new way of doing science. So here's my, my pitch to graduate students. So I, I thought about this. So we think like people with, with um, dark, lighter hair like me now, we still think like this sort of old way of doing things in effect because we've been brought up this way. But, but such radical change that we're facing can't be adequately addressed with our current more or less in incremental approach. I think we just have to really deeply rethink everything from collaborations to technologies to, to everything. And the other thing is, as a pep talk to students, if you were doing this, note that your professors were handicapped compared to you by 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 12th. And so you can think much, how much more you can do than your professors could. <laughs> OK. So, so this all sounds exciting, but I, I now want to just point out that there are uh, serious caveats to every single thing. This is introducing more problems than solutions, actually. So this also came out the month I came to the National Science Foundation. Suddenly, the stock market went down by, I don't know, 1,000 points or something ridiculous. And the world economy collapsed. And then uh, this was our, the response. Don't worry, I'm on top of it. So I, I liken this to the cyber crisis, which is that um, there are all of these problems we have and we really don't know how to deal with them on virtually any of these things, in particular education and organizational structures. I'll, I'll say a few words about that going forward. So let me just point out, without providing any solutions, but just point out some of the problems. So in computing, I, I sort of naively said, well, you can saturate a petascale computer with Einstein's equations and, and hydrodynamics, which you can. Um, but what are the computers going to look like? Well, there, there's been a step function in the number of cores in, in supercomputers in the last decade that suddenly we're up into the literally hundreds of thousands of them. And so someone's pointed out that 
if you remember the early Macintosh, the, uh, the old original Macintosh from 1983 that came out when I was in graduate school, um, that had as many transistors in its Motorola chip as we now have cores in a supercomputer. So it's like bit level pr computing between sending you know, bits of information between transistors and a chip. That's the level of complexity that we're now being faced with. And so it's no longer adequate as a professor to just do it as my, as my advisor to just sort of give me some equations and say, OK, just you'll have to code these up on a supercomputer. That's just not, you can't do that anymore. So you have to really think about new, uh, new software environments, new ways of doing this, the new programming models, the fault tolerance. You know how it is on any, on any uh, computer, like a laptop or a phone even, something is always going wrong. These have millions of components. And so the fault tolerance has to be really rethought of your uh, codes and so on. So, but I want to focus particularly on the data piece, because that is what is so new. Um, so I'll just point out, I got this graph from Chris Johnson a few years ago from the University of Utah. And it's a graph of the amount of information in terms of gigabytes on a logarithmic scale as a function of time. And so the, the, this is the, perhaps the one that we're all facing. The amount of information you can store in your brain is basically at zero, and it's the only one that's going down over time, OK? <laughs> so the others are all going up, and uh, it's, it's quite scary. And there's a particular point here that it's been calculated that about five years ago, there was a crossover to we are generating more data every year, and this is unique data. So somehow the study has tried to correct for the fact that there are many copies of data. This is unique digital data than we did not only in the last year before, but in all previous years integrated, OK? All the way, if you digitize all documents of all human history and so on, you still, uh, you add it all up. Next year, we generate more than that, all of that amount of data. And that's going up. And so we've reached a crossover point also because we can't store all the data. So it, it turns out that uh, most estimates are showing that we're generating more data than we can possibly store. And so we have to make decisions about this as well. Just, those are just general points. So there are like tons of reports that all say this. Um, and so uh, that, I think, is one of our biggest challenges uh, as a fa the foundation at NSF or uh, a a among science communities and so on. But I'll just point out these other two, which I've thought a lot about. And I, I'm, I think uh, this, the campus here has really thought a lot about this in particular. The organizational structures that are needed for multidisciplinary science and for, for computational science are, are rather different. And these are quotes from the executive summary of the PITAC report, the Presidential Information Technology Advisory Committee report from 2005. This is actually to uh, report to President Bush. The first point I, I always point out to universities is that they must significantly change their organizational structures to remain competitive because the problems we're looking at don't fit in, the, in traditional departments very well, or sometimes they do, but many times they don't. And, uh, and also the issue about computational science emerging as a discipline as opposed to something you sort of give to a graduate student to do. It's, it has a distinct intellectual agenda. And we at, at NSF, I would just say we have not figured out how to fund this appropriately. It's one of my missions is to figure out how to do this in the right way. And I'll point out, I think this center, uh, this institute is is one of the, the world premier institutes for multidisciplinary science, particularly with physics as an enabler for many other disciplines. And so it's a, been a, it's a fantastic model that many have, have copied. And then uh, also um, there's a, a program in computational science here that, uh, that Linda has been uh, spearheading. And I think it's a model, uh, among others, for, for others around the, the country and around the world. So I think these are areas that are clearly going to grow tremendously as we figure out how to do them. And of course, I want to point out that with all of this changing, the questions of how you actually do education in these environments has to be asked very deeply. So what do we do to educate people? Um, and so I was talking to Linda earlier. I think these days, software has become a, a bona fide modern language of science in a way that's more pervasive than mathematics, frankly. It, it just is. Because you often, without having necessarily fundamental mathematics, you at least have algorithmic thinking. Perhaps you might call that mathematics, but, but probably a mathematician wouldn't. And uh, it, it's something that you still have to instantiate in a software code. And so yet, almost no students these days, even these days, are trained in software engineering. But you couldn't imagine a physicist getting a PhD without learning about orthogonal functions and complex variables in a very deep way, and so on. So they're the tools of the trade, and yet we're not not educating people to effectively use them. So, so I'll just point out then that this is sort of a cartoon version of what we would call a kind of a national 
cyber infrastructure to support this kind of science. And so these are $30 million investments in supercomputers plus the uh, operation and maintenance. So that's like $60 million at a, at a pop. That's what's called track two there. Track one is the uh, Blue Waters facility at the University of Illinois. We're beginning to think about data, but we haven't quite figured out uh, what the community really needs or wants. And I think no one really knows about it. Uh, what, what exactly is needed there? Software, we're, for the first time ever, we have a, a NSF-wide program to begin to support software as a first-class citizen, but it's still in the early phases. The most important thing is that all of the people who do research don't live at the NSF or even at, at, at specific um, labs, but they're just distributed across campuses. And so that's where we need to develop a, a, a sort of a, a coherent approach towards connecting campus environments with the national environments. And then, there's the, the University of Illinois supercomputer that's going into place. That's just to remind you that on these campuses, there are little large hadron colliders worth of data popping up in everybody's lab. Of course, we have these things, these large facilities. These are billion dollar projects and typically, there's two or 300 million of that is going towards developing computing and data storage and service and software and all of that. So these are very large cyber infrastructure projects these days, just as much as, as Larry Smart like to say, they're more silicon than steel because they are really very computational. And so how do we integrate that? Typically what happens is project A, B, C, D, and E all say, I need a billion dollars in my project. I need 300 million of that for advanced computing and data services. And I know how to do that better than anybody else, so I shouldn't have to be bothered with trying to work it out with another project. And yet, we can't afford this anymore. And it, if you do that, it goes completely against the idea that these would be collaborative environments where people say to coordinate data in multi-messenger astronomy. So you, you really think about, we need to think about how to coordinate these investments. And then this is, this is really ultimately my fundamental point. You have a, a new graduate student who has perhaps a, a problem of looking at some aspect of a gamma ray burst, and this student really needs access to potentially all of this stuff in order to do that one problem. So it's not like uh, this, is just, this is just for the high energy physicist, that's just for the astronomer. Potentially we need to, to provide data services that cut across all of these things. All right, so this just says that science demands the integration of all of these components. Now, the thing I'm getting more concerned about, though, is, is this. How, how could you reproduce a piece of science that involved all of those components in a reliable way? I, uh, so I think we have a, a, a problem on our hands there. If you publish a paper, um, somebody might check the results and the methodology to the level that they can, but they typically can't get at, at the data that you used in order to, uh, to produce those results. Even the XY plot in your PhysRev letters, I mean, I know people I would say I've never done this myself, made plots small enough that you couldn't really see every data point in, in, the, in the logarithmic plot because uh, there's stuff you just don't want people to see. But we should make all of that data actually available for others to replot and so on. I, I think it's criminal that we don't do more of that. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. So how do you really create this uh, environment where this is reproducible in a deep way? So I think I'll skip over this, but we're developing uh, plans uh, with a large grant called Exceed, which is the Extreme Science and Engineering Digital Environment, which is a, about a $130 million award to sort of begin to stitch together supercomputer centers and campuses. So it's just been launched actually in the last uh, few months. So it's the beginning of, of a sort of a national cyber infrastructure, but there's much more to do. But I want to come to, to conclude the last couple of part on recommendations and, and the focus specifically on data. So. Um, when I came to NSF, I launched a series of six task forces that began to look at all of these aspects. This is from the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. This is, this is very cyber infrastructure oriented. But the key one for this was the so-called Grand Challenges Task Force. That's the science uh, that drives all of these other investments. So how do groups work together and what do they need in order to do their science? And I would say the, perhaps the top recommendation is that we must have permanent programmatic activities in computational and data-enabled science uh, at NSF. And so I'm, I'm still working very hard to, uh, to establish that in a way that really makes sense across the different disciplines. And so as, as Linda likes to say, it's an interdisciplinary discipline. And that means at NSF, you have to find the right way to get the physics division to work with the chemistry division, to work with the computer science director, to work with the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, and so on. And, and that's as hard there as it is on a university campus. Perhaps it's harder even. So 
So the focus on data. The last few things I want to point out are, are issues on where we're going in terms of thinking through the policy and the, and the culture of this and what we're trying to do at NSF. So I more or less said these things already. I'll just point out that this little factoid that uh, a year and a half ago it was pointed out that the US mobile phone traffic actually had transmitted an exabyte of data on, uh, on cell phones. Of course, there are millions of them uh, in aggregate across the, the country. But I think I'll just skip here and say, just begin to ask some questions around data. So with all this talk on data and communities, there are clearly a lot of boundaries around data right now. So how do we remove them so that people are able to work together? How do we incentivize sharing? And so if you'll, I'll come to this in a minute, but you'll note, if you submit an NSF proposal now, you must submit a data management plan or you can't submit the proposal. That's a new requirement, which a lot of you probably regard as a pain in the neck. And probably Mike gets a lot of requests like, what does this mean? Why do I have to do this? And where would I put data on the campus here? So we. Who pays for it? There's that too. <laughs> so we don't have necessarily answers to those questions, but we want people to ask those questions now. And that's now, it's a criterion for a review as well. So if you have a lousy data management plan, you could have your, your peer reviewers say that that's just not adequate. And it, so it, it, it could get you in trouble in terms of your review. Okay. Um, it, you don't have, by the way, it does not say that you have to share your data. It simply says you must demonstrate that you have adequate data management plans to, to handle your data. And now, there may be requirements in certain communities where it is customary to share your data. Or for example, if you work at the South Pole, you're required by international treaty to make your data available within a certain period of time. So there are requirements in, in some cases for this, but, so, but typically not so much. So another one is, if you're dealing with data now, how can you attribute credit for this new publication form? Because now there are people who are developing careers around providing data sets and, and adding to them and curating them and providing the analysis tools and so on. So how do you do that? And what is a publication anyway in this, in this modern world? Uh, and so I'll tell you that we are beginning probably within the year, you'll see changes to the grant proposal guide at NSF that will say, we want to see from your prior research results the five most, well right now it says the five most important results of your publications. And now we're, we're going to generalize that with some language we're working on that says the five most important products of your prior research, including but not limited to publications, citable data sets, citable software environments, and such things to give people the incentives that this is important. And I hope that'll be translated back into promotion and tenure committees as well, that this, this is actually important. All right, so the last couple of slides, I just want to talk about the fundamental points on data and publication policy. I've been spending a lot of time on this lately. Communities work together by sharing data. These are sort of pie in the sky statements. Publicly funded scientific data and publications should be available to the public. So you think that that makes sense. There has to be a place to keep the data and a way to access it. And there needs to be an affordable, sustainable cost model. So we have increasingly difficult um, questions or, or principles to actually adhere to. So here are the kinds of things that start coming up immediately. So what do you mean by data? Um, so the Large Hadron Collider, as most of you know, throws away most of the data at the time it's collected because it's just irrelevant. It didn't pass certain criteria and, and m most of it's just discarded immediately. But even after all that, there's so much data, there are petabytes and petabytes from every single run. In fact, from the first warm-up run from the Atlas experiment, there was the 35 petabyte data set that was uh, uh, replicated, well, seven petabytes replicated to 35 uh, mul at multiple tier one sites and so on. So that's a lot of data. So which parts of that have to be made available? Uh, right now, we're not requiring any of that to be made available. Ha is it peer reviewed? And when does it be have to be made available? Should there be a vetting period and so on? So the, all of these questions are, are being asked. Where do you place it? One thing that's really important is that I think libraries are beginning to really rethink their their mission. They're no longer the keeper of just books. They're the keeper of scientific knowledge and literature and research results and so on, which is increasingly digital. So many libraries are now curating data sets. For example, the Johns Hopkins Library actually curates the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, as part of their mission, that's just as one example. And so who pays for this? So to answer Mike's point, it is possible uh, to submit as part of your NSF grant application uh, sufficient funds to provide the data services that you think are needed. Of course, uh, that's going to get more and more expensive. So we're looking hard at what we need to do at, in terms of a national data infrastructure to support this. But we haven't uh, 
Haven't yet figured that out. And so how long do you have to make it available? And from an agency point of view, once your grant's expired, what leverage do we have to, for you to continue to, to do this? And if we had a, a structure or if libraries were engaged, I think we would begin to, to address that. So what we've learned after thinking about this for a couple of years is that obviously one size doesn't fit all. Different communities work very differently. Uh, and so we are now beginning to think about bringing communities together to brainstorm this, to develop concept papers, and we'll begin to fund groups to prototype out some solutions. And then over time, we will think about how we would uh, to fund this in a, in a more systematic way. So there are a lot of changes coming at NSF very specifically on this point on data. Um, I, I can't tell you how, how incredible the transformation has been at NSF in the last three years, from almost never talking about this to having this be like the front and center conversation with any group, from the science board to when, when we're called by publishers or from the community. It's, it's just the biggest problem now. So here's what NSF policy says right now. Investigators are expected to share with other researchers at no more than incremental cost within a reasonable time, so there's no, nothing is quantitative here, the primary data that's gathered. So now you have to have this, um, this data management plan, and the National Science Board, as I said, is looking every, at every single project, and it even has a report out with recommendations to NSF on what to do on this. So I would just say that I think it's pretty clear with all of this that this is an important new area for the future of science, and I think for the it goes to the heart of science for interdisciplinary work and for reproducibility. We need this kind of a structure in place, but we haven't figured it out yet. So this is, the, but it's front and center in terms of thinking. So I'll just conclude by saying, I, I think I shortly I try to convince you, and you, I know many of you are already preaching these same uh, uh, stories to people as well, that we need a comprehensive approach to solving uh, science, to addressing science problems. There are many exponentials in every area of the computational aspects of this. Also collaborations, while maybe not growing exponentially, are, are becoming rather large to solve complex problems. The data intensive part of this is the biggest unsolved problem in terms of the methodologies of science these days that we're focusing a lot on. And I think we have to really rethink policy uh, and on publications. I'm working a lot with publishers these days to think about are there models to actually support open publishing with linking of data, particularly with the physics community. And I think we have a lot of work to do, both uh, among the agencies and, and within the academic community. So I, I'll just stop there. Thanks. Um, there, there are many, many possibilities and things we're working on. I, the fundamental problem against this is not that the people don't want to do it. It's that, frankly, there are the people, we don't have enough staff compared to the workload, and therefore people, uh, as much as they want to work together, are finding it, it very hard, I mean, simply to, to organize and, and so on. So I think that, I mean, that's just a practical issue. And it's getting worse as pro proposal pressure gets up. So that, that's one of the issues. I, I just see, you know, we say, okay, let's create a working group to look at this. Everybody's like, God, I don't have time for another working group. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think there are new structures that need to be put in place. Uh, for example, this computational science program. Uh, I th right now we have a sort of a, a model where the Office of Cyber Infrastructure would sort of steward this, but not alone, because I think it would be too focused on the technologies if that office really just did a computational science program, for example. So there has to be a, a collaborative way where there are proposals that come in and they collaboratively manage a program across uh, the, the, the divisions, uh, across the foundation. Now, people say, well, why don't you just create one in MPS? Well, I know what would happen just in, if I did it only in MPS. The mathematicians would, would see a proposal coming in and say, well, this doesn't look like it's advancing fundamental mathematics. The physicists would say it's not enough for about fundamental physics and so on. So it has to be collaborative with this kind of a, a structure in place with funding available so that it's not coming out of the, the, the core programs. That's, I mean, from a practical point of view, that's what it comes down to. Um, there are also possibilities. People have talked about reorganizing NSF in, in very extreme ways. Uh, 
uh, within MPS. There are, there are heretics that think that um, MPS is not one discipline. <laughs> Math and physical sciences, well, clearly it isn't. And so are there more effective structures, for example, materials and chemistry? Would they be more naturally aligned with other parts of molecular sciences, for example? from bio. So there, there are many discussions about these things, but the inertia in, in every single existing structure is quite high. So the question is to come up with a compelling uh, vision that you think would actually work before actually this would happen. So communities, uh, if you could help us think through what are the right structures at NSF, I know David has a lot of strong feelings about this as well. Uh, I, I think uh, we need some, uh, some guidance on how the best way to organize this is. Mike. Uh, on the, on these, uh Big data set problem. Uh, it, it really are, you know, in two extreme cases, there's the, the hiring physics community or uh, the Sky Survey or, or the Hubble, where basically there's a there's a center that's so large that it naturally owns this problem. I mean, and, right. And we did a Fermi lab for the big data. Um, and, but uh, the thing that's changed now is that. You know, every field is getting into this. You know, ecology is getting into this, and, and these are fields that have no big centers. To, there's no natural place. To, you know, and uh, you know, universities don't. So part of the issue there is just who is driving the discussion about what these fields need and what they should do and what. We, and and there are particular examples where, for example, at NCs, the people working on you know how do you share. Uh, metadata topology, but uh, there's a really the, this need for data management plans in some sense is running ahead of the fact that uh, field by field it needs to be organized somehow. Right. And that I and I I'm not sure I see how we get from here. So let me give you an example. I'll sorry, I'll give you an example of how we've uh, begun to approach this. So the geosciences directorate recently um, held an event they called the Earth Cube Charette. So uh, the Charette being the sort of vehicle to to bring different ideas together from the community. And so geosciences, while it sounds fairly homogeneous, it actually spans from people who work on the Earth core to you know solar uh, uh, winds and so on. And so these groups have, think they have very very different needs. And so they put them in a room with some professional moderators for four days. Uh, uh, with some cyber infrastructure people, and it, the, uh, from what I've heard, is the first day was just chaos, and no one could really see eye to eye. But after the, by the fourth day, they really uh, they began to see some common themes, and so now NSF is funding through the Eager mechanism uh, a number of uh, concept papers, so they could begin. And, and these these collaborations developed kind of on the spot, with the idea that after a year. They would then take the ideas and then fund a much larger uh, action that, depending on what the communities have come up with, could be more like distributed things from campuses, uh, federated perhaps, perhaps there are some centers, perhaps NCAR gets engaged in this. I mean, there are many different possibilities. But right now, I think no one knows enough to know exactly what's needed. They just all need. And so we're going to repeat that, actually. So in MPS, we're trying to organize something like that along two different dimensions. One is the long tail of science. Uh, where you have the sort of heterogeneous sort of uh, groups, a bit like the geoscientist charrette, and the other one is, is the big data problem, where you'd have like the accelerators and, and so on. So, so those of you out there who might be involved in LIGO or data uh, intensive astronomy, um, we get proposals that sound pretty similar. Um, we need data services for projects X, Y, and Z, um, and yet we can't possibly fund them all individually. If you could talk to yourselves and talk among yourselves about better ways to sort of be more coherent about it. I think we'll begin to get somewhere. Yeah, Bob. I think this is really a follow-up to Mike's uh, question. For some 30 years or more, um, the NSF has been running some sort of supercomputing program. And <clears throat> I think that the idea was that there are lots of fields that need access to supercomputers, and it's more economical to for every field to have its own. But somehow the data storage from the data that comes over to those computers, you don't seem to have the same philosophy. In fact, you know, you have things such as the San Diego Supercomputer Center is no longer a big NSF provider, but they can provide the storage of huge amounts of data there. And suddenly there's no access to it. Don't you need to really have a national program, which you hinted at, 
<coughs> but my understanding is certainly that in the current grant program, no one has responsibility for the pay for school. Will they exceed? I think so. I, I, they're definitely talking about that a lot. Uh, I, I, I've talked for hours with some of the, the people in that uh, project about this problem. And then we're talking about trying to use that potentially as a substrate to build other services on top of, particularly around the area of data. But, uh, but not to tie it specifically to that, but if, if it makes sense to encourage communities to sort of band together with those projects. Because they have sort of the beginnings of a, a more coherent national cyber infrastructure at the early, I mean, building on the terror grid, I mean, you, you know all this stuff. So the point is that um, I think there's a, a chance we'll do this. And uh, I think one very good thing is, um, very often the administration, I've learned, is, is, is involved in, in one priority or another, but they all see the, the data problem. So if you talk to anybody at OSTP or even the Office of Management and Budget, they get this as a real big problem now. Other agencies, there's an interagency working group that's convened by OSTP specifically to look at this. And so they're, all, they're brainstorming all kinds of things. So you will see, I'm sure, there will be calls for some kind of a national data infrastructure within a year or two. I mean, that, that's in the drawing boards, but no one's quite sure what it would look like yet. That's great. A lot of the very important things you were talking about can't really happen. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yes? Um, I, I don't, well, it, there was interestingly, we just had recently had a conversation about should we put a value on, on supercomputer time based on the, you know, the cost of the machines and the, uh, the operating and maintenance costs so that when people get a grant of a million hours, they realize that's really worth a lot of money and they should be, <laughs> it's a precious resource and so on. On data, I think uh, you're talking somewhat about the economic uh, sort of valuation of that. I, I think uh, we haven't gotten very far with that, but that we did talk about actually beginning to account for data services, which has really not been done at all in the past. So I think maybe we're beginning to think about that. But I mean, on the other hand, um, at the level of astronomy, uh, some people would say, well, gee, do you need a billion dollar telescope? But I mean, and, and so it only generates data for a certain hundreds of astronomers or something like that. I've, I've heard those kinds of arguments. But on the other hand, you simply can't do the astronomy these days without those instruments. And so those communities then are able to make those priorities and say, yes, we have to do that. So within the astronomy division at NSF, over 50% of the funding actually goes for operating and maintenance costs on those uh, facilities. And that does include uh, data services and so on. So they're willing to spend more money there because it's the only way to do observational astronomy these days. Well, I guess my point is, you know, that's a lot of money in communication. Mm -hmm. Somehow you never see any, any of the investment in data services that you have data or... You will, I think, because uh, there's just this recognition that, that, uh, that it's all becoming data-oriented, and so that part of it's got to be uh, considered as well. Yes, yeah, there has absolutely been exactly that. In fact, in discussions with NASA on how we might coordinate with NASA on that, particularly in astronomy, astronomical data. So, um, I mean, that those are just discussions right now, so there are no specific plans, but, yeah. I know. <laughs> Right. And I understand it's really early days, but the second part of that, however, is, is actually a historical problem. Because if you try to go back, say, 50 years, 
call and yep. you want to maintain data for 50 years hence, how do you plan to do that? But if you look back this year, you can't do it. And so there, there needs to be some real thought. It's easy to look at five years, but it's not easy to look at 50 years. Right. So I, I totally agree. I mean, I point out in some of my talks that I went to a university uh, for graduate school that has a beautiful Gutenberg Bible, and you can still read that. And I can't read my own PhD thesis from the, the diskette that it's taped on anymore. It just, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yes, that's where this idea of data curation comes in. And so we're beginning to really pay a lot of attention to that in plans for what these data services would be like and, and so on. And I think uh, that's where the library, and, uh, the library community needs to be engaged. Right. And there is something about the fact that only organizations are, you know, are used to curating data for a time after the people who actually produce them are actually libraries. And so mm -hmm. there's something about that. But of course, libraries are a very far from the problem. Somehow or other, there's going to have to be things that are attached to libraries that are able to do things like that. So some libraries are very forward thinking about this. So I, I've had a, a lot of discussions with particularly people at Johns Hopkins and MIT uh, and Michigan, just I'm mean, sort of I. I happen to talk to people at those places, and they're really thinking a lot about the future of libraries and their role in this particular uh, problem. But on the first one, I, I agree with you that we've put this data management plan in place. We didn't want to be overly prescriptive uh, because we knew that it was too difficult to do that, and yet that creates chaos because we basically weren't very prescriptive at all, and so people don't understand what, what on earth we're really talking about. So we tried to lay out uh, guidelines by discipline uh, and by division and within MPS uh, is specifically, but they're not very, uh, very detailed right now. They will get more detailed in time. And I'll tell you, I'm honestly, having watched what happens in review panels, um, sometimes they get to that part of the discussion, and sometimes they don't at this stage. And so we, we just need to do more <laughs> to make that better. I, I agree. <laughs> okay. So why don't we wind up? And then... All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed that.